Um, I'll start with a uh, statement. I'm not a clinical psychologist. I don't work directly uh, on uh, uh, clinical or mental health issues. I'm um, a community environmental psychologist. I work predominantly on community issues, but um, sorry, with the, um, the, the sort of uh, interface between uh, community and, and uh, environment. And within that, that sort of transition sits uh, disaster risk reduction, uh, because uh, one of the major aspects of the, the environments that people interact with is uh, uh, what happens when they, they, they turn uh, hazardous. So many of us choose to live in areas where uh, the natural world creates uh, many amenities, but uh, periodically uh, these uh, turn uh, sort of um, hazardous. Um, I will look at how to sort of link in some of what we're covering to, to, to tie in with your interest in sort of mental health. Um, but <clears throat> but there, there are a couple of things that I want to, to, to cover. First of all, it's about um, we have many disasters, um, but we also have relatively few uh, disasters. Uh, and given the fact that these are rare, very complex, and they will change from sort of one time to another, that no two earthquakes are ever the same, no two typhoons are ever the same, uh, is that one of the things that we, we don't tend to do very much, from, uh, much about is to actually learn from the events that we have, is to understand what happens, why it happens, and whether or not we can take those lessons and use them to, to, to build people's understanding of the, uh, uh, the relationship that they have with their, uh, uh, their, their environment. My principal interest in, uh, in, in this area is about readiness or preparedness. Uh, I'm interested in why, pr predominantly in terms of why people do not prepare for uh, natural hazard events that they, they know are going to, to occur. So even though people do, they acknowledge their risk, they do not uh, necessarily um, uh, prepare for those events. To put it into, in, into perspective is that um, one of the, the first studies I did in this area was in Auckland and New Zealand, uh, and uh, we asked uh, people, are you aware of the fact that you're living on top of a volcano? 92% said, said, yes, they are. Uh, now, how many of those people did something about it? Now, put this in context is that this question was asked as um, uh, uh, Auckland, uh, the local government, was advising people that we were long overdue for an, an eruption in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in Auckland. So 92% said, yes, we know we live on a, a volcano. So how many had done something about it? 4%. So acknowledging risk and doing something about that risk is not the same. Uh, and yet, a lot of risk communication is, as the name suggests, about communicating about risk is not actually that, um, uh, 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 that, that effective. So, and I'm interested in identifying what people have to contend with and what they will need to be able to do in order to, uh, to, to, to deal with that. So how do we develop uh, adaptive capacity and resilience to be able to deal with highly infrequent uh, e events, but events that are uh, very challenging, very complex, and uh, may last um, a, a, a considerable period of uh, uh, time. Um, and <clears throat> for this particular meeting, I also want to sort of reframe some of that in terms of what is that, what is what I do mean for what you are interested in. So we understand how people, communities, and societies interact in, in different ways. What does that mean for understanding the context in which you are going to de develop and deliver uh, psychological uh, uh, intervention? particularly in terms of you know, how do we prepare people to, you know, in terms of like a, a kind of stress inoculation for, uh, for, for natural hazard uh, uh, events. So the, um, the, the overall goals of uh, my research sort of fall into to three categories. I am interested in uh, understanding the resources that people br can bring to bear to, to deal with challenging and adverse uh, uh, experiences. And I'm interested in how that sort of translates into what are the psychological and social factors that influence people's ability to anticipate what they're going to have to deal with in the future. Uh, how they use those uh, resources to cope with and adapt to um, complex, evolving, and um, consequences which are very difficult to an anticipate. Uh, we'll talk about some of those uh, later. Um, and uh, we do that so before, during, and after the hazard events itself. 
Um, the, the before issue arises, um, uh, this, this work again sort of developed in New Zealand and that was strongly influenced by uh, preparing and red readiness for volcanic eruptions. And volcanic crises are quite unique in that some can be preceded by very long, um, um, as in fact, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Precursory periods. Um, uh, in some cases, like in Rabaul, is the the precursory period was 20 years. So people knew that something was quite likely to happen, but not much right, much did. Um, <clears throat> and there are, there are a lot of issues that arise beyond that, which we don't we want to go into uh, today. So really, so that puts what I do sort of uh, in, into uh, perspective. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> we. Hazard events do not occur um, uh, all the time, sort of fortunately, otherwise we would be in that a bit more trouble than we actually, uh, that we actually are. But in, term, in terms of the, the, the nature of the, the experiences that, that hazard events create for people is that the best way to learn anything is by example. Uh, and uh, when we do get uh, that natural, when we do get sort of disasters, is that we could learn uh, a lot about uh, what people will have to contend with, what works, what doesn't work, what has to change, uh, and so on, by uh, not only analysing uh, and researching within the context of, uh, of that uh, response, recovery, and uh, and, and rebuilding, uh, but taking those lessons and uh, using them to, to build greater capacity uh, into the uh, uh, in, into the future. Um, now these issues are being sort of embodied more in concepts of like sort of build back better and uh, linking relief, rehabilitation, and, and development. Uh, but uh, do we do this? Uh, well, the answer is uh, really uh, no. And famous quote from Hegel is that what uh, the experience and history teach us is that uh, people in governments have never learned anything from history or acted on principles uh, deduced uh, from it. And if we translate that into a, a DRR space, is that our failure to, uh, uh, to, to research uh, uh, people's experiences, to encapsulate uh, those experiences in uh, sort of developmental programs, is making uh, a, a clearly avoidable contribution to sustaining people's vulnerability. Uh, and the very infrequent nature of these events makes it quite important that we uh, look at ways in which we can learn from, uh, from these events. Now, in terms of um, what I do, in terms of being interested in preparedness and, and, and readiness, uh, is, it is a, a, an area that has uh, become much more common over the past 30, 40, 50 years. But uh, in researching um, readiness is that the earliest uh, uh, example of um, uh, a, a public pronouncement of the need for readiness um, uh, is uh, fairly local. Um, it's been around for 2,500 years ago, Confucius was arguing for, uh, for people to be uh, vigilant about their environment, uh, uh, to be sort of cautious about uh, overestimating their security and safety in times of, uh, of, uh, of uh, plenty. But, uh, you know, 2,005 years later, it's really good for me because it gives me lots of research grants because nobody is doing these, <laughs> these things. But at the same time, it... Uh, uh, it, it, um, it, it posts a very sort of clear warning: is that as these events become more, co uh, more, more, uh, or as the potential for disasters, as Tom, aka Reiner, um, uh, introduced uh, yesterday, uh, is um, uh, we're going to have to deal with more of um, uh, of, of these events, uh, and um, uh, we should be uh, doing a lot more to learn the lessons from what um, uh, what uh, what happens now. I guess it's really sort of my version of what uh, Tom talked about yesterday is the, the yellow line is the number of hazard events worldwide um, from about, about 2000, well, about a, a period of uh, about 100 years. And the red bars are the number of disasters. Now, what is, is very clear is that certainly the number of hazard events has increased. And uh, this has been sort of predominantly in meteorological and hydrological hazards. So they're, uh, they're linked to, to climate change, even though it doesn't exist. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, clear. But the, the, the key thing is that the, uh, the number of disasters is far outstripping the increase in the number of hazard events. So it's not that we're getting uh, more. Things like there, there are not any more earthquakes occurring. They, they're pretty much sort of stable. Um, we're getting more um, uh, typhoons, hurricanes. We're getting more uh, storms. Um, uh, but 
there are more and more people living in areas which are putting themselves at risk. There's more and more development that is taking place uh, within these areas so that when those hazard events occur, uh, the losses are, uh, increase, uh, are increasing sort of exponentially. So it becomes uh, important to, to look at I mean, how do we reduce this gap. And most of these are decisions that we have some control over because we are deciding to live and develop in a particular place. We are deciding to have families. We are deciding not to build to um, uh, codes or uh, to, uh, to, to, maintain or to perform the kinds of activities that will reduce uh, our uh, exposure. Um, so um, my work is situated in, in this space, but particularly in, uh, in terms of preparedness and, and how we develop people's capacity to adapt and co or to cope and adapt. Uh, with hazard consequences um, and how these can be enacted uh, when people face uh, hazard events, particularly to, uh, to, to develop capacity to, be, for, to allow people to be able to respond to events rather than having to react to events uh, when they, uh, they occur. And uh, within the, 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 uh, the, the context of learning lessons from these uh, events is that how do we uh, research uh, disaster response, uh, recovery and rebuilding in ways that will actually allow us to extract important lessons that we can impart, impart to, uh, uh, to communities that will remain uh, at risk um, from, uh, from, from natural hazards. So <clears throat> that's sort of my, uh, my interest. In terms of you know, how I would sort of translate to um, your sort of interest in, in mental health is that now, readiness and preparedness is, if you think of it as sort of stress inoculation, because the more people anticipate what they are going to, uh, to experience, the easier it is for them to, um, to take action to confront those issues or to decide what they're going to do. Um, uh, preparedness programs are designed to look at ways in which we can mobilize people's capacity to be able to cope with that, uh, with that disruption, both the immediate disruption uh, and what happens uh, later on. Um, and uh, it's, uh, again, the more we sort of prepare people, uh, the, uh, the, the more we can sort of take steps to reduce the psychological impact impact of dealing with threatening and challenging uh, events, which will be sort of quite that long duration. Uh, a secondary reason for uh, looking at, uh, at that sort of process is that uh, given the sort of increasing sort of likelihood of the, the increasing numbers of people who are going to be affected by, uh, by disasters, uh, mental health resources are uh, limited. You will not be able to provide appropriate services for everybody. So <clears throat> it is good to be able to uh, reduce the demand for your services, to be able to assess those that are likely to, to be able to respond uh, better than, than others. So to have that kind of mental health triage is to, uh, to be able to direct your services to those that are going to benefit most from, uh, from those. So if we have uh, inadequate resources, uh, uh, we can develop... Um, this work into to ways in which we can uh, uh, prepare more effectively about the use of resources uh, that we, uh, we have. Now, when we look at the, the kinds of events that occur, I mean, the uh, earthquakes and tsunamis are still the, the, the big ticket uh, hazards followed by uh, flooding and wave surges. But in this context, I think that what is um, uh, very important in this area is to, to appreciate is that the, the locations uh, that are most likely to be affected by these events, the countries and the areas that are most likely to benefit from um, psychological research and intervention uh, tend to be very different from uh, those countries where theories, models and practices have tended to develop, which is still uh, predominantly um, uh, sort of Western countries. Uh, and uh, if we, uh, on an international stage, uh, if we think about the, these issues, is that uh, theory and practice must be able to function effectively across a range of different hazards. So we must be able to apply uh, our skills, our knowledge, our capabilities, no matter what has happened, so whether it's an earthquake, a flood, uh, or a pandemic. It, um, uh, we need to have um, a good sort of evidence-based models that will guide uh, what we, uh, how we, we, we operate. But um, given the... Uh, the, the, the the, the distribution of hazards and uh, the populations that they're going to interact with, it also becomes important to understand uh, sort of cultural and indigenous sort of diversity and to, um, to understand whether and how our theories are going to be applicable across that type of uh, social and cultural uh, diversity. 
Um, that raises uh, issues about whether or not the theories that we use to guide our practice are culturally universal. Uh, do they, you know, can, can we identify uh, uh, sort of common aspects of um, um, in how we manage our, our, our mental health? Uh, mental health problems? Can we identify common aspects of uh, the theory that would guide uh, disaster risk, uh, risk reduction? Um, so, this is situated, but puts sort of that into sort of context what I'm interested in, which is predominantly in sort of learning uh, more about the sort of um, uh, the, the, the universality of, uh, of psychological theory and uh, how the uh, cultural similarities and cultural differences can be uh, accommodated into training and, uh, and practice. We obviously need sort of an evidence-based approach. Um, um, uh, Tom's going to be talking uh, more tomorrow about some of the uh, uh, the methodological issues that arise in uh, what is a, a very sort of complex uh, area, uh, but uh, having an evidence-based approach is uh, is quite uh, important. Uh, even though we may have to to rethink what actually constitutes evidence uh, in the uh, in the future. So uh, this is where my sort of research sort of comes into this, is that this is work that was really driven by, uh, I was a member of the Risk Interpretation and Action subgroup of the uh, IRDR, uh, and uh, part of my goal there was to, um, uh, to uh, look at the, um, at the all hazards utility of particular theories. So uh, many theories of uh, readiness are developed uh, for a specific uh, sort of hazard. Uh, but the uh, IRDR were looking at um, whether or not it was possible to actually develop theory or could, could we actually demonstrate that the theory was applicable irrespective of the hazard that, that we were dealing with. And that's quite important because hazards differ in terms of the outcomes of any sort of readiness endeavours. Preparing for a volcanic eruption is very different from pre preparing for a flu pandemic. But the theory must be capable, or a good theory must be capable of predicting um, uh, uh, all of those sort of different uh, uh, outcomes. So in terms of this particular work is, is based on trust and uh, trust was selected as the, 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 for the, the sort of kernel uh, for this sort of theory development because natural hazards remain relatively sort of infrequent. Um, many people, who, how many of you have actually, how many of you have actually experienced a, a, a large scale disaster? One Okay, how, another, how many of you have not experienced a large-scale disaster? Okay, right. Uh, so, it, most of us. Now, uh, now, that creates a bit of a problem, because if we don't experience these things, you know, how do we know what we're going to deal with? Now, it would be great you know, if we could hire an earthquake and take it home for a weekend and you know, see what it's like, and, you know, and so find out for real you know, what, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, that'd be okay. But we can't do that. So we have to rely on other people. And that means we rely on experts. We rely on, on government. We rely on uh, people with whom we have quite complex relationships with. And if we're going to feel or how we make decisions about uncertainty is strongly influenced by whether we trust the people that we get information from. Um, so uh, starting with trust, it was then sort of work. There's a bit more to it than, than this. There's a lot of things that... that I can send papers to anybody who wants to, to look at the development of this, uh, this model. But working back from that, it was identifying as well, people ha how do people go about making decisions under conditions of uncertainty? As they will not know what they, they can they know that they're in an earthquake uh, prone area, but nobody will be able to tell them when it is going to occur, how big it's going to be, how long it's going to last, how it's going to interact with their house or the, their immediate uh, environment. Um, so, uh, it's important that people, uh, we cannot look at, the, how do people construct their understanding of risk? Well, within the risk literature, one of the, uh, the key determinants of that is talking to other people. When we're faced with uncertainty, the first thing that we do is that we ask people that we know, people that we um, uh, affiliate with, people that, that, that we uh, interact with regularly. So I'll ask you, what do you think about this? And... As we talk about that, we build our model of risk. Now, that could be we used to say it's never going to happen, or we can say it's something we need to prepare for. Um, so uh, the degree to which people are actively engaged with other people becomes an important predictor of um, uh, the development of people's risk beliefs. Now, if people have been, again, faced with uncertainty, once people have developed their views about risk and what they think they might do about it, the second variable uh, was uh, sort of collective efficacy. Do people have, have experience of working together with other people to put these ideas into practice? Uh, and again, when we deal with uh, so formulate risk, 
translate that into a set of uh, actions. But in many cases, because people did not have access to, um, again, the infrequent nature of these events, the uncertain nature of these events, is that uh, people in communities are rarely going to have all the resources that they might need, the knowledge or as physical resources. And that, that means that they have to interact with, uh, with professional sources of that information. And whether or not these uh, actions can be translated into um, uh, specific actions is a function of whether or not the, uh, the professional sources, the government, the risk management agencies, provide communities and individuals with what they need, not what they think people want, but what they need. So whether they empower people to, uh, to, to act. <coughs> well, people formulate risk, formulate their actions, get the resources that they need, then they will trust the, uh, those sources, uh, and uh, then they move into uh, to actually preparing. Uh, I'll leave out the intention, but it's, uh, it's really in, in, People could ask about that, that later, but in the, the interests of, uh, of time. Uh, and that leads to some degrees of readiness. Now, going back, these, these are, are common characteristics of, uh, uh, of any sort of social context. Uh, there are a couple of um, hazard-specific variables within the, uh, the theory itself. And outcome expectancy, so you're probably familiar with that as psychologists, is it? Outcome expectancy is our, our belief about whether or not... Um, uh, uh, whether, whether we believe a particular outcome w will arise in a particular circumstance. Positive outcome expectancy is about people believing that if they, if they perform these actions, their safety will increase. Negative outcome expectancy is where people do not believe that it's possible to do anything to deal with a catastrophic event. So it has a, a negative influence on uh, what people are likely to, 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 to do. Uh, but anyway, um, in terms of looking at the, sort of the all hazards element, the, this theory has been tested for a number of different hazards. Um, uh, earthquake, tsunami, bushfire, pandemic. Uh, it's also been used on, uh, uh, for, for floods, but uh, we didn't have enough space to put that, that, that in. But the uh, key uh, issue is really is that there is, it has it's possible to demonstrate that a theory can um, have uh, sort of predictive utility across a range of very different hazards that, that involve very different knowledge, very different uh, uh, behaviours. Uh, it's also identifying differences in what people have to, to be able to, uh, to, to do and what, what being prepared um, actually means. Um, and take too long to go, to go into these things. But I'd say that the, the, what I'd like you to take from this is that preparedness is not one thing. People need to secure their houses and their property. People need to develop the items that they need to survive. People need to develop the relationships with their neighbours uh, and other community members that they will rely on uh, for help and, and assistance. Um, um, people need to be psychologically prepared to deal with the, uh, the impact of uh, uh, these events. People need to consider their livelihoods and what's going to happen if they can't work, um, they cannot get to work. Um, how are they going to, to, uh, to, to survive? And uh, people need to understand how they are going to, uh, to, to relate to, uh, uh, to uh, sort of government agencies and uh, NGOs and others in order to, uh, uh, to further their, uh, their survival uh, or, or uh, how they, they deal with the, uh, the, the events. Now, um, so to test the, uh, the all hazards part. The second element was about uh, taking on, on board the fact that, that disasters are no great respecter of cultural boundaries or national boundaries, is that they, uh, they occur around the planet. And um, as a consequence of that is that they, uh, uh, the, the, the impact on people that, have, that differ very substantially in their social and cultural characteristics. So the uh, uh, next question is, can something like this work uh, across um, uh, different, uh, different cultures? Well... It can, at least to some extent. Uh, I'm going to use of, uh, uh, earthquake preparedness as uh, a, a, an example. And uh, <clears throat> this is looking at um, testing the, uh, the theory for earthquake preparedness in three, um, uh, uh, three different countries. These three countries were selected because of their relative positions on uh, sort of Hofstede's uh, individualism, collectivism uh, scale. Now the argument is, is that um, it would be physically impossible to test a theory in every single country on the planet. 
but uh, looking at work by um, uh, sort of Hofstede and others, is that they've been able to identify is that there are a number of key characteristics that define uh, the nature of, uh, of a given community. And so every country on the planet can be described in terms of its relative position on, uh, in Hofstede's model, one of five um, uh, sort of dimensions. Uh, Tropinar's another one that they've developed about five or six sort of dimensions. But the the argument here is that if we can test, um, or looking at sort of individualism and collectivism, if we can test a theory in a highly individualistic country and a highly collectivistic country, then and if it works on both extremes, then there's a reasonable uh, assumption to say it's probably going to, to work sort of in between. So we've got three countries, relatively high individualism in the middle, and high uh, high collectivism in uh, in Taiwan. Um, so the uh, Studies were done in Napier, New Zealand, um, prior to uh, the, uh, the 2011 Christchurch earthquake. The 1931 Napier earthquake was the last major uh, earthquake in, uh, in New Zealand. Uh, the Taiwanese work was done in Tongshu. Is that my pronunciation correct? Xie Xie. Um, um, and uh, so again, looking at a hacker population. Uh, in central Taiwan, and the uh, Japanese work was done in Kyoto. That's not Kyoto, that's Kobe. Uh, but, uh, I couldn't find a, an interesting picture of Kyoto that looked disastery. So, um, uh, that's quite a, an interesting picture itself, because these are kind of images that are used to change people's negative outcome expectancies. Negative outcome expectancy is where people think earthquakes are too big and catastrophic for anything that I can do to make a difference. So if you show people pictures like this, this uh, you can say, well, What's happening here? Well, this building collapsed, but this didn't. Therefore, the earthquake is not uh, uniformly uh, destructive. Somebody must have made a decision to design this building better than that building. Um, and that uh, creates these sort of doubts in people's minds that they start to think that it's possible to, uh, to mitigate these, uh, the, the risk. So uh, taking the, the relative positions of New Zealand, Japan, and Taiwan, uh, on uh, Hofstede's uh, individualism and collectivism scale, uh, the theory was tested in, the three, uh, the, in these three uh, uh, communities. And although there are some path differences, uh, is that uh, overall the, uh, the, 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 the variables and the relationships between the variables were broadly supported across uh, these uh, different areas. Uh, we've done something similar for volcanic preparedness, which looked at New Zealand, Japan, and Indonesia, and forest fire preparedness, which compared Australia and Portugal, um, and uh, the same conclusions uh, prevail. Uh, there were some sort of interesting issues, but um, again, uh, I think that it's possible to, uh, to to develop a theory which may have uh, some um, uh, sort of cultural uh, uh, sort of universality. Uh, now. It is important to understand is, is that because that, when we look at things like sort of community participation, people in every country participate in things with other people in that, that country. So uh, all we're asking is, do you participate with others? And that provides the context in which risk itself is discussed. We're not saying, <coughs> we're not assuming that they all, they all participate in exactly the same uh, way. Um, uh, so but developing a more sort of generic framework allows for that uh, uh, sort of comparison to, uh, to, to take place. Now, now the, the Taiwanese work was done in a community that had been affected by an event, but most of the uh, uh, most readiness or preparedness research tends to be conducted before events have actually occurred. Otherwise, there'd be little point. Um, but it does raise uh, certain uh, questions, and that is, it does, to, to what extent is um, uh, research and a theory that's developed uh, out of the, the context of an actual disaster a good predictor of what happens in uh, an actual uh, uh, sort of disaster? So uh, is there a parallel between what, what people identify in a, sort of a readiness space um, and uh, found in, what, uh, in, in how people actually deal with the effects of a disaster. And that's the whole point about preparedness research, is to identify what is going to make a difference to people's ability to cope, adapt, and recover um, as much as possible uh, using their, uh, their own uh, uh, resources. Um, in terms of the, in the context of uh, the, the present meeting, uh, there's also sort of um, uh, uh, is interesting to understand what happens in the sort of response and recovery space in terms of um, what kinds of natural recovery processes take place. <clears throat> so what do people do when they are affected by a, a natural disaster? And that's 
uh, kind of that sort of natural recovery? Is that are there sort of commonalities in terms of the things that people do? Uh, and uh, if that occurs, what does that mean for your developing and delivering psychological intervention? So a bit sort of understanding that sort of context. How are you going to uh, to ensure that what you do is sort of complements those uh, th th those natural resources? Because if you go in and, and, and work with people, unless you're going to to work with those individuals for for several years, is that you have to ensure is that you know, that's a, you know do no harm, but it's ensuring that uh, whatever you deliver will sort of map that will sort of match onto or lap, uh, map onto what those natural recovery processes are so that you're effectively bolstering those, uh, those natural resources and people's recovery will continue even if you are not uh, there to, uh, to continue to, to, to work with them. So that's the, uh, that, that's the goal. So um, to what extent can we um, uh, provide, uh, or to what extent do we see these sort of parallels sort of taking place between the sort of preparedness research and uh, recovery research? Well. The first example draws on the, the, the Christchurch earthquake uh, and the studies that I conducted um, about six months after the 2011, so the February 2011 earthquake. Um, so uh, we did uh, interviews with um, uh, affected communities uh, in sort of July and August. So they'd had the February uh, earthquake and a major June uh, sort of uh, aftershock. So uh, it was working with people while they were going through uh, their, uh, their, their actual recovery. Uh, and uh, this used uh, sort of a technique uh, called life course interviewing. I don't know if you've come across that. Life course interviewing is that you start with, uh, you ask people to, to map out their experiences. So you give them a big, uh, a, a blank graph which has you know, earthquake and present day. And then they sort of plot out you know, what went well, what went badly. What, you know, and you can map out those experiences. And so people outline the sort of temporal course of their experiences and then you conduct interviews around each of those points. So people said this, this worked really well. Why did that happen? What did you do? What did others do? So we can build a picture. And it, it, um, although the data is still sort of retrospectively collected, it, um, it, it allows for a smoother temporal flow of, of information to capture what is sort of changing uh, over time. Um, now, in terms of the, the time issue is quite important because people identify different aspects of readiness being important at, uh, at different times. So, um, they recognised that they, they should have done a lot more to secure their homes. Uh, and that's quite a big, uh, a big issue. Um, as many people were displaced unnecessarily simply because they hadn't secured their chimneys or uh, done even sort of basic uh, preparation to secure their, uh, their huts. Um, in the immediate sort of impact uh, period, people experienced greater problems because they had to go out and find water. They had to find food. Um, it was also interesting that this event, uh, the, the, the event this, on which this research was based, was in February 2011. That was not the first earthquake in the sequence, which was in uh, September 2010. Um, I give an example of what's called the gambler's fallacy. Have you come across that? Um, well, earthquake in September 2010, uh, for many sort of Cantabrians, that's it. those earthquakes occur in, uh, in Christchurch like once every 2,000 years. So the gambler's fallacy is, okay, that's our turn, done, no damage, we don't need any of this preparedness anymore. So many people became uh, less prepared. Uh, but in that, that impact period, the kind of things that people talked about that made them sort of resilient or helped them cope was we need to have more food and water. Uh, we need to have medicines. We need to have things to keep the kids uh, entertained. Um, we need to be able to do this without any external uh, sort of help. And they identified psychological preparedness as, as important as physical preparedness. That uh, is dealing with constant aftershocks, and that was over now a, a two plus year period. When did they? Sorry, when did they stop? Um, we, the last significant big one was December two thousand twelve. So I'm looking at almost now eighteen months, two years worth of um, uh, of constant sort of aftershocks. Uh, the third thing that people mentioned was once, once the sort of dust had settled and things that when you know, in between sort of major aftershocks is that you had to be able to work well with, with, with other people in your community to you know, shore up houses, do running repairs. Um, uh, there were also issues about people's jobs as nobody had thought much about you know, what happens if I can't get to work? What happens if my workplace shuts down? Um, so uh, there were many secondary problems that arose because they, these issues had not been, uh, been dealt with. 
and uh, within sort of three, four months is that so it was all, the, the major sources of stress were nothing to do with the earthquake. It was dealing with insurance companies, uh, dealing with the national government agencies, dealing with local government agencies uh, uh, that people had to cope with. So what made a difference to, uh, to what, what influenced all these? Well, quite a lot of things uh, is that uh, there were many uh, elements that, that influenced what people had to, had to do. And there um, the, uh, the analysis identified that there were personal, family, community, as well as institutional factors that all sort of interacted but in, uh, in different ways in order to, uh, uh, to, to influence what people, uh, what people did. Um, what was uh, uh, important was that uh, people talked about things like the, the importance of being able to, to work with other people to, uh, to, to resolve um, uh, local community issues. Uh, they talked about the importance of, of trusting um, uh, insurance companies, trusting government agencies, trusting the local uh, institutions that were set up. And uh, they talked about how important that, that to be able to talk with other people was for, for what, they, uh, what they did. So there were parallels between what people uh, sort of identified as predicting how well they could deal with these uh, challenges and the, um, uh, the, the readiness research. So that was the, um, uh, the, the Taiwanese, uh, the, the New Zealand work. The second example is from um, the 921 um, um, uh, earthquake. Now, the data that was, uh, that was used here is slightly different uh, because it was originally collected by my colleague, uh, Dr. Jang, to look at post-traumatic growth following this. But we reanalyzed re the data to look more at sort of preparedness uh, uh, issues. So that's the epicenter of the 921 earthquake. That house there used to be there. And it took, in one minute, 58 seconds, it went from there to... Uh, uh, to, to, to there. Uh, it was a very interesting earthquake because it had vertical and horizontal uh, movements at a level that was not uh, an anticipated and that created uh, damage even in sort of uh, well-designed buildings simply because um, uh, nobody really anticipated that uh, the, the, the uplift was something like 10 metres in, 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 in some places. You know, that's um, so quite big. Um, so, uh, and um, uh, damage further afield as Professor Chen uh, pointed out uh, yesterday. So I'm um, sort of running out of time, as is uh, the way that these things go. Um, similar kind of issues. There, there, there were significant differences between Taiwan and New Zealand in that um, uh, uh, people didn't tend to talk about themselves so much. Uh, they were more sort of embedded in family and community context, uh, and that's had a more uh, important uh, um, uh, sort of influence. Many of the characteristics that they talked about was because these uh, were the data were collected from a, a hacker community, um, reflected on what's called the hacker spirit. So there's a sort of uh, sort of cultural collection of uh, of factors that, that create the sort of culturally implicit resilience uh, that were um, uh, important. The other major difference was uh, uh, the discussion about the importance of how to coexist with a, a hazardous environment, which was not present in. Uh, uh, in New Zealand, so it was important to, to live in harmony with nature, to work uh, with nature in terms of how things are, 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 are done. But again, there was um, some sort of support for the, uh, the theory uh, it, itself. Um, working with uh, another colleague from Tai Chung, uh, Professor Lu, uh, in looking at uh, a, an emergent measure of social capital uh, that uh, sort of came out of uh, a village called Hoping in central Taiwan, which is badly affected by uh, the, uh, the earthquake. And because these people were, were cut off, is that uh, they, they sort of had to develop um, um, uh, uh, ways of, um, uh, of collectively dealing with the consequences uh, of uh, this, uh, uh, the, the event and their uh, relative isolation. And so uh, they tended to, to, to develop this new type of disaster-specific social capital. Um, in terms of learning from history, then there are questions about I mean, what is done to actually sustain this, and um, can these lessons be sort of picked up from that particular village and applied uh, elsewhere, as given that, that uh, these elements reflect people, they, they, they evolved and derived from people's actual experience of dealing with the consequence of a large uh, earthquake. So um, it may be important to look at ways in which these capacities can be developed in other, uh, other communities. So we can learn from experience by uh, looking at a lot of variables that emerge from uh, working with people in a disaster space, which and, and many of these um, did not appear. But things like self-efficacy and place attachment were not supported in the, the pre-event analysis. So people don't necessarily see these as uh, important. But when we look at what happens when people are faced uh, with adversity, uh, they become more uh, important. 
Um, we can also learn from the, the, the Taiwanese work in terms of similar kinds of issues uh, and a few uh, others that can be, um, uh, can be brought into to the, um, uh, to, to the fore. So uh, if we learn from experiences, we can look at ways in which we can develop uh, our sort of theories of readiness based on um, uh, information that's acquired from people who are actually going through a, a, a disaster. So it provides uh, a much more uh, accurate uh, and important sort of uh, insight into what is, is going on. In both uh, countries, we also need to look at more sort of cultural and ethnic issues. And uh, uh, the hacker spirit tended to create this type of sort of the Although the variables could be identified in, uh, in their experiences, amongst the Hakka, they were much more sort of culturally implicit than they would be in New Zealand, because that they were more, more separate. And uh, again, in, in New Zealand, uh, Maori culture uh, tended to sort of encompass um, a, a broader range of these characteristics within a sort of a suite of activities, so that they are implicit within uh, how they live their lives, rather than uh, on how they, they would need to be, uh, be, be developed. So we need to, to think about how to develop uh, some of these, uh, the, these issues. So in conclusion, I think I mean, particularly in, in disaster risk reduction, there are huge debates about what resilience is and, and what it looks like and how we, we, we measure it. Is that, um, I didn't think that I, I would like to argue that readiness and resilience are very um, are intertwined and that the, the, the elements that contribute to resilience are things like social and psychological capital and economic capital need to be invested in specific types of, uh, sort of disaster preparedness. Uh, resilience is itself context specific, so we need to look at well, how how do we take what people, what resources people have, and how do we facilitate people's ability to apply those in uh, complex uh, and challenging uh, disaster um, uh, events. And so, readiness is an important uh, aspect of that sort of translate translational process about how uh, we invest in what is in, is happening. Now, this also means that we have to change the way in which we think about disaster risk reduction, is that most of the effort is currently sort of uh, nested within risk management. So people who specialise in working with and researching the hazards that themselves. Uh, I'd argue that that's kind of pointless, because the things that, that um, the resources that are going to be um, uh, invested uh, come uh, not from a- any sort of hazard space. They reflect uh, people's it, it accumulate. They, they, the outcomes of people's accumulated experiences over uh, the course of their, uh, their, their lifetime. And developing these capabilities is much more of a community development activity than a risk management uh, activity. We develop the raw materials uh, through community development and look at how to apply them through risk management uh, uh, programs uh, within a, a community engagement um, uh, sort of context. Um, also important to, to, again, to think about how we, we, we tend to sort of conceptualise the social space uh, in which people are, are situated. Uh, again, this is sort of a, my sort of take on this is that um, strengths or resilience factors and vulnerability factors coexist. They don't exist across a continuum, so you're not resilient at one end and vulnerable at, uh, at the other. Uh, so things like uh, self-efficacy makes us more resilient. If you get low self-efficacy, you're just not that resilient. Um, it doesn't make you more vulnerable, uh, whereas things like learned helplessness makes you uh, more vulnerable, and the higher that is, the greater the, vul- the vulnerability. So it's possible to identify elements uh, within people, communities, and societies that contribute towards, uh, as, uh, that act as strengths or resilience factors, uh, or that act as, as vulnerability factors. And when conducting an analysis of these, uh, these elements, we have to anticipate is that uh, resilient people could live in resilient communities and resilient societies. And we can anticipate that there could be vulnerable people who live in vulnerable communities and vulnerable societies. But it's also possible to have a resilient person who lives in a very vulnerable society or a vulnerable person who lives uh, in a, uh, a more sort of resilient society. So in terms of how we, we start to, um, uh, to, to understand <coughs> what this means for uh, that sort of overall uh, risk in terms of um, um, adaptation, post-traumatic growth, uh, loss or distress, uh, is that uh, we need to, uh, to, 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 to develop uh, more sort of complex uh, analytical frameworks to deal with these issues. We also need to change how we conceptualise risk. Um, if, I was to, if I was to ask any of you what risk is, or how many of you say it's about the likelihood of something bad happening? Hmm? Does anyone know where the, where the word risk comes from? 
It's an Italian word that is risicari, which, uh, which means to account for the gains and the losses in games of chance. It's a gambling term. Um, so risk, there's a risk of bad things happening, but there's a risk of good things uh, happening. And I think, again, to look at the, the, the local context, uh, look at the Chinese symbol for uh, the crisis, it's a mixture of a danger and an opportunity. Um, and um, particularly if we're going to, to adopt things like sort of a build back better framework, is that we need to stop framing uh, uh, our discussion of hazard issues in terms of loss, destruction, uh, and so on, and to accommodate the fact is that uh, we also have opportunities, uh, and those opportunities are to, to improve uh, people's lives. And Build Back Better, LR, the, L, the LRRD concept, is not about just helping people deal with future natural disasters. It's about improving social, economic, and psychological capital uh, that is important in everyday life. So, overall conclusion, if we can de demonstrate that a theory has some type, of, some level of cross-cultural uh, uh, applicability, it means that we can start to collaborate in research, because we have a common theoretical uh, uh, basis for that, uh, that, that collaboration, the same for, uh, for, for practice. If we can develop um, and, and more sort of universal or sort of cultural general uh, theories, it also means is that sort of developing countries which could uh, ill afford to actually do this kind of development work themselves will be able to use those theories uh, as a starting point to, uh, to develop their, their capabilities. Um, it can also be used for humanitarian aid uh, planning. But at the same time, it is also important to understand the, the, uh, the, the cultural differences that exist and how we can uh, learn from, uh, from those elements. So, uh, in terms of looking at sort of personal, cultural, community characteristics, um, the hacker spirit uh, gave some insights into to the way in which um, um, the particular sort of unique personal characteristics that map onto to, uh, to things like sort of outcome expectancy. Um, the hacker people that we interviewed have high outcome expectancy because they're used to dealing with typhoons and the impact that typhoons have on, uh, on, the, on, on their crops. But in, uh, in a, a social environment uh, from sort of Indonesia, Taiwan, New Zealand, Japan, Western countries, uh, China uh, and Taiwan, there, there are cultural uh, uh, influences that affect the way in which uh, the, uh, the, the, our, that influence the social space in, in which we, uh, we, we develop our risk management plans and what we, we do. The same with looking at uh, in Japan as uh, issues of uh, the, the concept of uh, chonikai as a, a, a means of community uh, uh, government. Uh, so, Shishi, thank you. Thank you, Douglas, for that. So do we have questions for Douglas? Yes. Oh, morning, Douglas. That's very interesting. So my question is, when we address a community that uh, just passed disaster event, uh, where should we go first? Because you, you just uh, explained so many factors that's relating, so where should we start? Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's always good to start with an easy question. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Um, I think that, that it would depend very much on the event itself. One of the, in terms of how to start, is one of the other projects that just finished in, in Australia has been using uh, social media. Uh, we, we worked with a specially developed Facebook page that was designed specifically to, to assist communities deal with their response and recovery. And so uh, we've been using that as a way of getting uh, effectively real-time uh, information about the kinds of issues that people were dealing with uh, how they were resolved, how they were uh, not resolved, and uh, we've been sort of mapping that onto, they were using that to sort of map onto uh, more sort of traditional uh, models of uh, sort of community re recovery. Um, and so that's probably quite a good resource that, that you have the, the, the capabilities to actually uh, to, to use that. Now, that, that was done in, uh, in, in Australia, so it was, and the, the event was not sufficiently large to uh, to destroy the, the infrastructure required for that kind of, uh, sort of communication. Um, but that's a more sort of general point. I'm not sure whether that uh, uh, approaches what you were actually interested okay, in. Okay, thank you. And actually, I have another question. Like in, in individual community, they just tend to invest um, in insurance for preparedness. Do you think it's enough? Um, no, um, I think. Uh, I think, again, because that's an insurance can often result in people overestimating the degree to which they are protected, but it is never going to, um, um, you cannot replace uh, any sort of important family mementos, documents, uh, things through, uh, uh, through insurance uh, it, itself. 
Um, there are uh, issues about um, whether you can actually sort of rebuild it in the first place. Um, you're better off to protect things uh, before the, the event. Uh, a lot of uh, issues in New Zealand is that, that it's been really hard to get enough uh, good tradespeople to actually a good, to do a good job of rebuilding. So uh, the insurance um, doesn't necessarily guarantee that your uh, that your property is going to be uh, rebuilt to the uh, to, to the same level. And a lot of the sort of preparedness work um, is uh, the, the cost of preparedness are actually sort of relatively low. And what is often needed is more guidance about uh, assessing and being able to uh, to to introduce the right kinds of uh, sort of measures to, to ensure that, that houses are going to be uh, relatively stable. And uh, securing property in the first place is very important. Is it, whether you're insured or not, if your house collapses, uh, if an earthquake, there's a pretty good chance you're going, to, you're, you're going to be killed because you happen to be in it when it collapses on top of you. Um, so uh, protecting your life is very important. But things like uh, in Christchurch, what people said is that, you know, Having to move out of the house was uh, was a problem uh, because you then had to you know, pack up the stuff to you and the kids go and live in a tent or with somebody else. Uh, then that was a bit inconvenient. If people prepare their houses, is they're creating the foundations for their resilience because you have a stable um, a, a, a dwelling uh, that is going to offer you protection. You are going to stay in your community. You are going to be able to uh, work with your neighbours and other members of your community. You are going to be able to start to rebuild your local economy because you'll be doing things uh, in those uh, areas. You have ready access to uh, known um, uh, uh, social support and so on. So uh, preparing the house is, is very important. And that mean a lot of uh, you know, the, the, the people we interviewed who'd lost their houses and was um, you know, just you know, for for the sake of a few nails and things like that, a bit more than that. But it was th that things that could be quite readily um, uh, resolved uh, that, that made for a very complex um, uh, recovery. Uh, and for a lot of things, is, again, the issues about repairs and how, how easy it was to, um, to 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 instigate those repairs. And yet, uh, when people do anything, is they tend to be they may you know, store food and water, but they very rarely actually look at um, securing the structural integrity of their house and. It is often not that expensive to, to provide enough to get enough to ensure that that it will remain um, uh, relatively intact and inhabitable uh, for uh, a reasonable length of time. Um, okay, if you just allow me to give uh, a comment uh, in the first question, let's see asked if I could share a bit of Indian experience, like, like how do we start like I need to work in the community issues in disaster as part of my research area. So when you see we have to start like uh, uh, in the phase of disaster preparedness, a lot of training with the systems which functions in a disaster, the training for the teachers, the training for the health worker, the training for the doctors, accommodating disaster preparedness in the school curriculum, accommodating the same disaster preparedness with the administrator, all the administrative training institute at state and central level. And in all this training also we have incorporated that there must be session on psychosocial issues. So at least the teacher, administrator and everybody knows with the practicality how mental health aspects and community aspirations are connected to uh, engage uh, into the aspects of facilitating resiliency or rebuild resiliency. So the issue is now more at the level of uh, putting it to the people and a lot of SMS service before any rains or cyclone issue in particular region of India and lot of remote sensing data is being shared with the vulnerable population like fishing community who has to go out and the ham radio has started. So these are some of the initiative and to look that community voluntary system what you said I really liked it very very much because we see that when the voluntary spirit is high in the community, automatically disaster resiliency goes higher. So in that context, engaging the community and systems become very uh, very important. And thank you for this wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, I would also like to... Sorry, I think she was next. Okay. <laughs> uh, Douglas, I appreciate your presentation, especially in the part of the conclusion where you emphasize that after the prevention and response, there should be recovery. Because in the Philippines, specifically in our province in Albay, we have been awarded for DRR, but they admitted that they lack in the recovery part, especially in being gender specific. 
and, um, and also in the children where we have the girl and the boy children and being very specific for their needs, especially in disaster. So I'm really banking on your last note where you said uh, we could support probably financially or technically <laughs> in terms of funding or like supporting the programs that we have started for psychological wellness program. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, thanks. It was really a nice talk, uh, quite insightful. Uh, what uh, we have done in India, uh, like there is, I don't know about the other countries, but we are having civil defense volunteers. And we have started training the civil defense volunteers because whenever there is some disaster, the first people who respond to the, uh, the rescue uh, uh, function are the civil defense volunteers. So when we give them the training, the preparedness training and the orientation about how the psycholog psychological factors are important, we have found that that is working well. Mm -hmm. And another issue uh, that is a request to all the, uh, the participants here, what I have uh, taken for myself also as um, this uh, uh, in, in, in this uh, international union of uh, union of psychology is providing uh, all the monetary support to have uh, to so that we can learn from the workshop. So wherever whichever the state we go, if you at least contact some of the universities or the schools, so that there we can volunteer as a psychological first aid trainer for at least for half day or the full day uh, to the students, and that can. Uh, it, give a lot of support system who can work in their local disaster. So probably we can commit from our part. So that will be of much help. Mm. You might also be interested in there's the, the Japanese concept of Jushubo, is it that sort of you yeah. Is that uh, is is a bit like it's it's more of a, a, a neighborhood support resource which has a very strong sort of DRR and, and response and recovery role, but it does other things as well. So you don't just have uh, volunteers who do uh, DRR work. They also other, they work in the arts, um, uh, community protection, crime prevention, um, they, they, across a range of different areas. So it builds uh, a lot of capacity through developing relationships that are uh, independent of, but very important drivers of how well people deal with uh, with emergencies. Uh, it sort of builds trust um, and other things, but uh, it works very well because of its links with uh, that um, uh, particular sort of governance model, which where you have a uh, so a, a local governance mechanism that translates national policy into uh, sort of local applicability. Can I, can I just add to that response? I think it's, it's a really important point where you're essentially saying, where can we magnify our contribution as psychologists to this response and recovery task? So one example would be in New Zealand is that um, the cross uh, were integrally involved in door knocking and checking on people, but in the Red Cross governance structure they realised that actually they were exposing some of these volunteers to quite tricky situations. Um, so one of their commitments was to better prepare their volunteers, but they were worried about how to do that. So one of my inputs was to work with Red Cross using a train-the-trainer -the -trainer model. So not just going along myself and doing the training, but to train other trainers and for them to have a handbook that had been properly gone through with a communicating concept and they would get very uh, comprehensive training to be able to do that. And so safety for them, safety for the volunteers that were doing it and a lasting legacy that then they're now prepared for the next disaster, not just that disaster. So really thinking about how you magnify your input. One psychologist has an impact upon the whole organisation and if you're organised about doing that, using those governance and community trust structures, I think it, it, it's, a, it's an incredible opportunity. Good. Thank you, Dallas. Uh, I'm interested in empowerment. So, um, how to assess empowerment in your study and uh, what's the role of uh, empowerment in DRR? Thank you. Um, well, uh, empowerment is effectively a two-way process. Is it is about empower people who interact with empowering settings. So people need to be able to define the issues that they face. They need to be able to represent those, those issues. So it's not enough for a community to say, we need help. 
They need to say, we need something to help us build this. We need something to give us information on for, for, for this group, for our children, or whatever that, that, that happens to be. So the empower, empowered community is about uh, people who can get together to define their problems, to represent their problems. Uh, and empowering settings uh, come from the sort of agency side, as that is in uh, their ability to actually meet the needs that people have, rather than just provide uh, general information. So uh, there are uh, sort of well-established uh, mechanisms to, to test that. So uh, we have measures for empowerment, which have been used in uh, New Zealand, Australia, US, uh, Taiwan, um, Indonesia, where else? Portugal. Um, so I think that the... So it would be possible for you to have a, a measure that you could probably use, uh, and Thailand as well. Yeah, but um, uh, part of the, the overall goal of the research is to, uh, to, to look more, how, how, how can we develop those measures more effectively through collaborative research? <clears throat> so what would work well in, um, uh, you know, in, uh, in China or Taiwan or in, in Thailand uh, may be sort of quite different. So we need to do more work to look at how we would actually develop models that, uh, or, or measures uh, that have that, that greater applicability. There's a lot of cultural factors, things like this. Again, uh, looking at sort of the, the hacker, they have you know, that sort of cultural suite of capabilities which are quite unique to them. And there may be some others that we could we look at. So you, we have a, a measure which has uh, been, um, uh, has been subjected to face validity and so statistical um, uh, assessment uh, in uh, many different countries. But the uh, I mean, what I would like to see is more sort of collaboration on how we would actually develop more um, uh, culturally specific measures of each of the, those variables and, and what we can learn through that uh, comparative process. Any other questions? Hi, Douglas. Um, we're, we're talking about cross-cultural perspectives here, and uh, even though your measure is there, somehow says that it's almost the same, right? The, the result of your test, but is there anything that is very much innate in, I mean, very much unique in your study about the societal perspectives in Taiwan, in New Zealand, or in Japan, that is, you know, when, when you hear these countries, you would realize that, oh, this kind of perspective is very much Japanese, or very much Taiwanese, or very much Kiwi. So could you tell us something about that? Um, well, I think, the, uh, I think this, this summarizes what those unique characteristics are. So. Um, when the, when the model sort of... Um, so we're looking at, 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 at these variables, so they're, they're quite sort of generic. They, they, they're, they're, they're capturing aspects of people's lives that reflect uh, people's accumulated experiences. But the, uh, the variables themselves do not inquire about how do people participate, how did people develop their sense of collective efficacy, or how they are uh, uh, empowered. Uh, is that... Um, uh, those, the answers to those questions come how, uh, understanding more about how uh, these sort of uh, more sort of culture specific mechanisms um, um, uh, influence what, what is happening. So things like uh, in the hacker spirit is because that represents um, a, a, a cluster uh, of items that, that, that are constantly present um, and culturally implicit uh, within that particular population. Uh, in uh, New Zealand, people had to decide I'm going to you know, spend time talking with you um, uh, and decide, are we going to work together on a, on a project? That was not the case in, um, in, uh, 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 in, with the, the hacker population. Uh, when we, we did this work in, in Thailand after the 2004 tsunami, is that was the, the measure of collective efficacy had a, you know, a zero was that I will not do anything with other people to seven up do, do lots. And in Thailand, they couldn't accept that. They could not accept that people would do nothing. So we had to reframe that so that there would be people might do a little with other people or a lot with other people, but they, you could not do nothing. They just, that was not, um, it just, they could not understand how people would not uh, work together with, that, with, with others. So, um, but within that is the then a need to look at, well, you know, how, how do we sort of unpack some of those issues and how do we look at how to, to recreate those, uh, those benefits of our, most of my work, because I start with a Western perspective and then look at what we learn sort of elsewhere. It's about sort of unpacking those, uh, those sort of uh, 
cultural characteristics to identify what 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 is in there. But I need to, to, to work more with people who actually have that sort of cultural expertise to understand you know, how these actually function um, uh, together and can we actually look at how to, to model those kinds of relationships in, uh, in other countries. As in most Western countries is that each of these uh, variables represents people making specific choices about what they, uh, they, they want uh, to do. So from a, a research perspective, it is, uh, it, the, the interest is more on, on identifying what is similar and what is different and why, but to translate that more into, uh, to look at how we can optimise how we, we can learn lessons from that, uh, is that it's about working with, uh, with people in these communities to look at you know, what they do and, and how, they, uh, and how they, they, they function, and often looking at sort of different, um, uh, different ways of understanding how that, that happens. Um, I'm looking forward to part. I think it's going to be a very exciting project in, uh, based in Taiwan, which is going to be looking at how art uh, is used to, for uh, people who were displaced from Typhoon Morocco. Uh, so we're we'll working with um, uh, some Taiwanese artists to look at how they are capturing the spirit of their, uh, uh, their homeland uh, and, and whether or not we can actually change or we can develop that so that we can use sort of art, song, music as, as ways of um, uh, supporting disaster risk reduction, but to do that in ways which uh, map onto the, the, the cultural um, elements that, that, that inform how these issues are, are, are sustained. Because one of the... the, the uh, here's a clue from the questions that I'm going to ask you. Is that one of the, the clues towards learning from uh, history is about how do we go about embedding things within uh, a community? Uh, if we have uh, strong uh, cultural capability uh, and social mechanisms, is that we we need to start by building from within about how we add um, our DRR or recovery issues onto what people already do, rather than. Uh, the, the, the current process, which tends to be risk management, sits out there as a, a very sort of different field, and you impose those sort of precepts on the people, and uh, often on the assumption that if you, if you tell something, if you tell people that, that something bad is going to happen, what to do about it is that, of course, they're going to do something about it, uh, and that works if you're a geologist or an emergency manager, but not for somebody um, who uh, does not have that training uh, or, or, or experience. Sorry. Long answer to <laughs> Last question. question. Right. I have a question. Uh, uh, what would you suggest uh, uh, in how, how should we go about sensitizing our government on this uh, and these issues in our country? <coughs> because, in my experience from Nepal, um, you know, the government was on now uh, <coughs> for almost uh, a week, at least for the three days. And it was just the community. You know? It was just your own family, your neighbors, your friends that were there for help. So, you know, uh, I was I trying to say, like, you know, how do you go about probably uh, just sensitizing the policymakers and uh, do something? I think that again reflects on um, what Tom said yesterday. I think if I could answer that question, I would be a very wealthy uh, person <laughs> in, 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 indeed. Um, uh, the, the getting into that sort of policy sphere is, is very difficult. Um, um, I don't know what it's like in Nepal, but certainly in Australia and New Zealand, is that politicians really don't like to do anything that's about bad things happening to, 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 to people. Um, uh, I've actually sort of working with, with um, uh, a student that's based at, at Sarge University who's from Nepal, and we are looking at that, uh, redeveloping this kind of model for, uh, for Nepal. So, you're welcome. First of all, let's thank Douglas for a wonderful presentation. Thank you.